We'll give people just one more minute and then get started. And you should all be able to see my slides and you should be able to hear me. Ah, I see a nod. Excellent. Thank you. Isabel, do you want me to get started or should I wait another minute or two? Well, you can get started if you want. Um, this is a recording that will be available to everyone, so I think you're good to go whenever. OK, I will go ahead and do that. It starts with introductions anyway. So welcome to this session on hypermobility spectrum disorders in children. And thank you so much for making time to listen to this and learn about this. So this is me, Professor Emeritus of Physical Therapy at Clarkson University. I've retired from full-time academic teaching, but I do still do a lot of education nationally on hypermobility. I am a physical therapist part-time at the Lawrence Avenue Physical Therapy Office. And um, the objectives of this session, so hopefully by the end of the hour, you'll be able to explain why it's important to recognize hypermobility in children. You'll be able to describe how hypermobility spectrum disorders or HSD presents in children, um, in, as well as describe the presentation of the most common comorbidities, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, POTS, and mast cell activation syndrome or disorder MCAS or MCAD be able to outline an approach to identifying the problem areas in these children and outline a management approach to hypermobility and the trifecta of HSD POTS and MCAS. So why the zebra? So most of us learned in school when you hear hoofbeats look for horses, not zebra. So common things are common. And while that's true, um, people with hypermobility are different and we need to recognize that they are different and how they're different. And this has led to a lot of confusion and suboptimal treatment in the past. And so we'll be talking about how people with hypermobility are different from non-hypermobile people today. So how might children with hypermobility present? So they may have recurrent or chronic musculoskeletal pain. It may look like growing pains. They may have functional problems like clumsiness, difficulty with handwriting. They may have frequent bruising and injuries, and this can sometimes look like child abuse. They may have orthostatic intolerance, complaint of dizziness, tachycardia, anxiety. They may have debilitating fatigue or sleep disturbance, chronic migraines or headaches, GI symptoms such as nausea, diarrhea, and constipation. Food sensitivities, they may be accused of being a fussy eater or as having an eating disorder. They may have multiple allergies and chemical sensitivities, incontinence and bladder dysfunction. And for the adolescent females, they may have heavy and painful menses. So it goes well beyond just having joint pain. And if you think about your patient population and how many of your patients have these complaints, um, it could be quite a number of them. The National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine has developed a guide for heritable disorders of connective tissue, of which hypermobility is the lead one. And they have a statement on the consequences of delayed or misdiagnosis that it's, I think it's worth taking a moment to go through, that it can lead to inappropriate medical interventions, inability to accurately assess the risks and benefits associated with medical procedures, inability to access the necessary accommodations, family stress and dysfunction, stress associated with unexplained and repeated evidence of trauma, which can lead to inappropriate suspicion of child abuse, inappropriate assessments and incorrect diagnoses, and mistrust of healthcare providers and negative expectations for healthcare encounters. And so these are all the things that we want to avoid by recognizing these patients early on. Research also shows that delayed diagnosis leads to poor pain control, functional deficits, and interference in school for children. This slide is about the pathophysiology. I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but it's here for your reference if you would like to look at it. But just a reminder that 
collagen is produced in the extracellular space, that the cell produces the pre-pro-collagen, which gets released into pro-collagen, which gets snipped into collagen, which then gets formed into collagen fibrils and fibers. And it may be that all those processes in the extracellular space are where the problem is. And that may be why there's no gene that's been identified for the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos or hypermobility spectrum. So generalized hypermobility, joint hypermobility, this is when people are bendy, but they don't have any symptoms. And it's important to realize that not everybody who's flexible has symptoms. We don't want to medicalize our healthy population. And then we have a group that have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. There are 13 subtypes of EDS, of which hypermobile EDS, we sometimes say heads, and hypermobility spectrum disorder, HSD, are the predominant. That is, they are 90% of all EDS. And the HSD, HEDS variant is the only type of EDS that has no genetic cause that's been identified. So the important take home here, genetic testing isn't helpful unless you suspect something other than the hypermobile type of EDS. And we'll talk about diagnosis in a moment, but just remember that genetic testing won't show you that it is hypermobile EDS or hypermobility spectrum. It'll just show you it's not something else. The other two most common types of EDS are classic, which is associated with a lot of severe skin issues. So the super stretchy skin and very poor scarring and healing. And so if you see a lot of these skin issues, you might wanna consider the classical EDS. Vascular EDS is relatively rare, but it's the life-threatening one. And so it's the one we don't want to miss just in case. And you can't really diagnose it by just looking at a person. They say they may have very visible veins on the chest, although many hypermobile people do as well. Some people will say there's a certain face phenotype, um, but research hasn't supported it. So you may suspect this primarily on the basis of family members having had catastrophic um, organ ruptures and vascular ruptures at an early age. This is when you do want to send them for uh, genetic testing. How common is hypermobility? Well, HEDS is the most common systemic inherited connective tissue disorder in humans. The overall prevalence, we think, of symptomatic hypermobility in the United States between one and 3%, but in healthcare, it's gonna be much, much higher. So 21% of pediatric PT patients were hypermobile. 37% of adults in a rheumatology clinic, 39% of adults in a pain clinic, and 30% of adults in primary care clinics. And if we look at that primary care and say, this is where your patients are, are going when they graduate from having a pediatrician, we can estimate that perhaps 30% of patients that see their pediatrician are likely to have symptomatic hypermobility. So it's a common condition in the healthcare environment for sure. The Baton scoring system or Biton is the way that we classify patients. It's not an ideal system, but it's quick and easy to do. There are nine points. So two for the finger, pinky finger, two for the thumb, two for the knees, two for the elbow, and one for the trunk. So extending the pinky finger past nine degrees at the MCP, bending the wrist and thumb so that the thumb touches the forearm, standing knee hyperextension past 10 degrees, passive elbow extension past 10 degrees, and the ability to put the hands flat on the floor um, when the knees are straight. And one thing about this particular criterion is that when you have kids after a growth spurt, they often have tight hamstrings. And even if they were hypermobile, the, those tight hamstrings might make this a negative test. So you might ask, did they used to be able to do this? In adults, the cutoff is five out of nine. In children, it is six out of nine. Um, but realize boys are, tend to be less hypermobile than girls, and so research shows that an appropriate cutoff for boys would be five out of nine um, for the younger boys, but the official criterion is six out of nine. These are the adult criteria, so the criteria for heads, 
And the first item is the generalized joint hypermobility, five out of nine for adults, six out of nine for kids. Criterion two is connective tissue disorder, family history, and musculoskeletal pain. And then the third criterion is the absence of another diagnosis that can better explain the condition. The HEDS criteria in adults are problematic because they fail to identify a lot of people who previously had diagnoses of joint hypermobility. And so then there was a second diagnosis called hypermobility spectrum disorder for all the people who didn't quite meet these criteria. These criteria were established by research geneticists for the purpose of studying for a, looking for a gene for the hypermobility type. So they were looking at Marfanoid habitus in particular. It's not a clinically determined, it is clinically determined. It wasn't a diagnostic criteria set for the purpose of making a clinical diagnosis. So we have this spectrum from asymptomatic to severe symptoms. In the asymptomatic, we have people with generalized joint laxity. And of course, they may have problems now and again. They may have sore muscles. They may sprain an ankle. They may get patellofemoral pain or plantar fasciitis. But in general, they're relatively asymptomatic. And we don't want to medicalize that population. In adults, we have that heads, the people who meet the checklist criteria. And then we have a much larger group who don't quite meet the checklist criteria, but are hypermobile and are symptomatic. And what's important to realize is that these two groups, HEADS and HSD, clinically look exactly the same. That is, one is not more severe than the other or more complicated than the other. In the clinic, we can't tell these patients apart, and genetic testing is not helpful unless you suspect another type of EDS. So in adults, I actually don't use the HEADS criteria because for me, if they have HSD, that's enough to make my clinical decisions. In 2023, they developed criteria specifically for children. And it's kind of interesting. They only have the HSD diagnosis now. So they did away with HEDS entirely, um, basically for the same reason I just explained. It's not helpful to separate adults into the two. So we again have the Biton score that kids need to score at least six out of nine here. There are some skin and tissue abnormalities, so soft skin, mild skin extensibility, unexplained stretch marks, um, atrophic scarring, piezogenic papules, those are little white um, knobs that form on the heel in weight bearing, and then recurrent hernias. And they would require a score of at least three here. And then musculoskeletal complications. Um, so recurrent or chronic musculoskeletal pain. And then another category that's not at all reflected in the HEDS criteria, comorbidities, chronic primary pain, chronic fatigue, functional GI disorders, functional bladder disorders, primary dysautonomia, and anxiety. And that's because children who present with hypermobility very often have these comorbidities that need to be managed. So these are the questions that you can ask to make the decision to walk through the criteria. And again, excluding other better explanations for the condition. This chart just divides up based on your answer to those four questions, whether it's present or not present, and it identifies subtypes. Not really necessary to put people into these subtypes, but if you choose to, this graph can help you do that. And again, there's no HEADS diagnosis for pediatric, only generalized joint hypermobility, which is asymptomatic, and HSD, which is symptomatic. The minimum age that they can be to make a diagnosis is five years old because the hypermobility assessment itself is not reliable be that before then because young children are often flexible. If you have a younger child who's very flexible and symptomatic, you would keep an eye on them and manage them as though they're probably hypermobile or probably have HSD. And then when they get to be five years, you can do the diagnostic criteria. So when should you refer? When do they need somebody to see somebody with a specialty um, 
discipline. Well, these are the different criteria. So for the patient, here are some findings. For example, a blue sclera, cardiac mur murmurs, a developmental disability, an intellectual disability, um, cleft palate, et cetera. So if you see those things in the patient's history, cardiac valve disease, heart disease, vascular rupture, those are those vascular HSD um, conditions or vascular EDS conditions that we do worry about. Some other things associated with the skin, poor wound healing that might suggest classical EDS. And then the family history, again, vascular problems, um, organ ruptures, et cetera. And this is a nice list, I think, for you guys to be able to say, okay, this kid is hypermobile. They've got, let's say, stomach problems and joint problems. Do I need to send them for further genetic testing? And this is the chart that can help you make that decision. In hypermobility, we call it the terrible trifecta, hypermobility, mast cell activation syndrome or disorder, I'll use those terms interchangeably, and postural orthostatic tachycardia. And these conditions frequently coexist, probably two thirds to three quarters of patients who are hypermobile will also have POTS or, and or MCAS. In the middle you see there's a lot of symptoms that are common to all three of them. So if you see these, pain, weakness, fatigue, diarrhea, brain fog, headaches, you can't tell which of these three conditions it's due to. And then each of these conditions has their own special findings. So mechanical issues like the tissue fragility, subluxations, easy bruising, um, central nervous system issues may be due to the mechanical aspect of hypermobility. Syncope, presyncope, dumping syndrome may be due to the autonomic aspect of POTS, and then things like flushing, pruritus or acaria, congestion, wheezing, inflammatory and allergic findings that may be due to the immune system in MCAS. So a little bit more about POTS and MCAS because you'll, you will see a lot of these. Um, so dysautonomia, POTS is the most common type of dysautonomia but the autonomic nervous system pretty much controls everything from the top of your head to your butt. And so your symptoms can be anywhere. There can be neurological symptoms. So migraine, brain fog, clouding, pulmonary symptoms. Of course, a lot of cardiovascular palpitations giving POTS its name, but other types of dysautonomia can have bradycardia, higher low blood pressure, blood pooling. There can be urinary issues, orthostatic intolerance when they stand up and, and pass out. Um, GI issues are very common in dysautonomia as well. Um, secret to more motor issues, so sweating, tearing, dry eyes, dry mouth, and then um, pupil control. Hypermobility is a risk factor for POTS, or POTS is a risk factor for hypermobility, we don't know. Common triggers for POTS, puberty is probably the most common trigger for POTS. So you guys are going to often be the first person to see these kids, these teenagers, when they start having symptoms. Concussion is a very common trigger. COVID is a common trigger. So long COVID is believed to be a combination of POTS and MCAS. Deconditioning for any reason and sleep disorders. The prevalence is believed to be about 7% in children and teens. And about a third of all patients who develop POTS have their symptoms begin before age 18 with a median age of 13 years, and the female to male ratio is five to one. So you guys are definitely going to see these people and often be the first person to hear about these symptoms. There are different types of POTS. You don't need to know this, but it's helpful to file away. They're not all the same. So hypovolumic POTS, there's not enough blood to pool in the feet and get to the brain at the same time. And that's probably the one that's most prevalent in hypermobility because the blood vessels are stretchy. And so the blood pools in the feet. Extreme fatigue and exercise intolerance. Neuropathic POTS, probably more common in concussion because of the trauma to the nervous system. So history of surgery, trauma, and these people will tend to have the purple hands and feet. And then hyperadrenergic POTS, so the adrenergic system overreacting, and these people will tend to present with dizziness and tremulousness. 
but do just file away that there are different types and they may respond differently to medications. So the hypovolemic type of POTS, if you give them propanolol to manage the tachycardia, you're gonna make them even more tired. And so they're gonna say they are super, super tired and the propanolol or beta blockers in general will make that worse. Mast cell activation, so mast cells, immune cells, nonspecific immune cells protecting us from the outside world, and they're in all of our tissues, mostly the tissues that protect us from the outside world, so your GI system, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, bloating, and GERD, your skin, so flushing, especially of the face, neck, and chest, rashes, hives, and itching, and the respiratory tract, and that's going to present as though it's an allergy or asthma. There are mast cells in the brain. They can lead to migraines, brain fog, trouble concentrating, anxiety, and depression. There are mast cells in the gynecological tract, so uterine cramps, bleeding, interstitial cystitis, the urinary tract, um, skeletal system. It can contribute to, to muscle and bone pain, and then the cardiovascular, and it, it may be that Mast cell activation is triggering POTS. That's another type, subtype of POTS, or it may be that mast cell activation aggravates the cardiovascular system on its own. Diagnostic criteria for mast cell activation are problematic. So the first one, that they have symptoms in two or more systems, that's pretty easy to get from the history. Item three, they get better after using antihistamines or other drug drugs that block chemicals released by mast cells. So these are the kids who are on taking Benadryl regularly, Zyrtec, Claritin, GERD medications, and they feel better. And then the second one is the problematic one, that there is a blood test, but it has a very, very high false negative rate, um, that the processing has to be that the tubes that you draw the blood into have to have been chilled on ice before you draw the blood. The blood has to remain on ice at all times. It can't be away from the ice for more than 15 seconds um, before the products break down. So for all practical purposes, we can't do this testing and even the expert labs often have to redo it a bunch of times. There is a questionnaire called the validated MCAS questionnaire. It's got a whole bunch of symptoms on it. And basically if they score more than a 14 points, it's a strong indication that they have mast cell activation. So it's basically, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Chronic fatigue is also very common in hypermobility. It can be due to the POTS. Um, it can be due to the medications for or aggravated by the medications for POTS. Deconditioning, if they have musculoskeletal pain and they stop exercising. Malnutrition due to GI problems, sleep dysfunction stress from medical issues, and the MCAS. And management for chronic fatigue, if we can identify and manage the causes, that's the best starting point. And then gradually increasing activity, whether it's exercise or daily activity. And PTs can help with this. So we can help manage fatigue when it's due to hypermobility and POTS and mast cell. GI dysfunction is present in all three of the conditions, and it's a little different in each of them. So in hypermobility, its trademark is gastroparesis. The gut tissues stretch out and they don't push foods through the gastric tract, so constipation. And then there's some other specific itch problems, the median arcuate ligament syndrome, superior mesenteric artery syndrome, which can be very problematic and basically stop people from eating at all because it is so painful to eat. POTS can be associated with dumping syndrome. That's an, a dysautonomia problem. And then MCAS commonly is associated with IBS and a lot of food medicine sensitivities. And this chart just lists through a whole bunch of the GI issues that are typical in people with hypermobility. And we always want to be checking for physical re reasons for disordered eating before we diagnose eating disorders. Sometimes these kids recognize that certain foods are bad for them and they won't eat those foods, or they may vomit every time they try to eat. And if that happens to you for long enough, you're going to not want to eat because it's so unpleasant, or they may have so much pain that they don't want to eat. So these patients often do have problems with eating, but it's not a psychological issue, it's a physiological issue. Bleeding disorders, this is new, this is just 2023. Um, 
information, 78% of hypermobile pediatric patients have bleeding disorders. Easy bruising is common in hypermobility, oral nosebleeds, minor wounds, heavy menstrual bleeding, excessive surgical bleeding, GI bleeding, hematomas. Um, so the bleeding assessment tool can be a useful screen. Normal pediatric scores should be zero to two. If they score above a two, um, a ref referral to a hematologist can be helpful. Um, and there are a couple of, of medications that are recommended in, in this article um, for these issues. Psychological comorbidities are common, anxiety, depression, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder. So a neurosensitive phenotype is common in hypermobility and in POTS, the eating disorder or disordered eating, sleep disorders. Um, and as I said, POTS and MCAS have their own psychological issues. So for these kids, don't interpret psychological issues as somatization um, or functional disorders. It may be related to their physical issue with the trifecta. So moving on to examination of children with HSD, and I tried to keep this general, so not too PT specific. Um, so depending on what they complain of the most, so are they complaining of pain and headaches, functional deficits, musculoskeletal pain, stomach issues, psychological, sleep and fatigue, urinary and bleeding issues. They can complain of all of these. And so you're focusing on what's most important to the patient or the family. The items in yellow are the ones that I deal with most in PT, and I'll talk a little bit more about them. These, Each of these symptoms or complaints can be associated with mast cell and POTS. So all of these are associated with POTS in particular. So sensitive nervous system, well, dysautonomia is a sensitive nervous system. GI issues with POTS, anxiety and ADHD, sleep disturbance, and then these are associated with MCAS. And so when patients present with these problems, it may be helpful to look at whether it's just the hypermobility or whether POTS or MCAS may be contributing. Musculoskeletal function problems, definitely the, the basics of what I do as a PT. So patients may complain of joint instability. They're spraining their ankle a lot, their shoulders slipping out, their kneecap is slipping out. Um, it may be deconditioning. They can't exercise because of their pain and instability. Hypermobility is associated with proprioceptive deficits. So the connective tissue, the ligaments and joint capsules are abnormally stretchy. The receptors, the proprioceptive receptors in those tissues aren't getting the input they want. And so people who are hypermobile often don't know where their bodies are. So they kind of fling them around. Um, they bump into things and this contributes to a lot of pathology. They also have motor control deficits. They can't necessarily control their muscles well. So again, they tend to fling their, their limbs around. They may hang on their, their hips or hang on their spine because they don't have that fine motor control. And I actually find that kids who are athletic, because they are working to improve proprioception and motor control, athletic kids are often better off than the sedentary kids. They may have muscle length and strength imbalances, so tight muscles, widespread inflammation, which can be aggravated by MCAS, posture and habits can contribute, and then excessive demands. Some kids can be completely active doing all normal things that kids would want to do. I've had kids who played soccer and baseball and normal sports and then and have tolerated it well. And then I've had some patients who did competitive cheerleading and competitive dance, and it was just too much for them. And then when I assess patients looking at posture, their alignment, joint laxity, proprioception, muscle tightness, strength, endurance, and autonomic function, if I think they have POTS. It's important to recognize that not all hypermobility is associated with instability. So hypermobility is just the increased physiological motion. Remember I said there are people who are hypermobile who have no abnormal symptoms. There often are skaters, are figure skaters, are gymnasts, are musicians. Laxity refers to excessive joint motion, but what causes clinical problems is the instability, lack of motor control, a sensation that the joint is slipping around, 
inability to control joints, particularly in mid range. So this is when the joints are slipping out, when it's painful, they're subluxing or dislocating or just too much wear and tear or too much muscle spasm trying to provide stability. So being hypermobile is not necessarily a problem, but being unstable is. So the physical exam should focus on the motor control, not just hypermobility. I don't wanna just know how many joints they can move. I wanna know whether they can control those joints. The Baton score that I showed you before is a good starting point, but other joints can be hypermobile and they can be hypermobile in other planes than the sagittal plane. So in this young lady, that's an excessive amount of neck extension. So I saw um, a young woman yesterday and her Baton score was a four out of, of nine, so kind of borderline, but she had 90 degrees of extension. She had 100 degrees of neck rotation and she had neck problems. And so that was hypermobile. This young man is, has hypermobile shoulders. She obviously has a hypermobile spine and hips. So whatever joints are relevant to what they're complaining about. Standing posture is helpful. So are their scapulae winging, feet flat. Fat, flat feet will run up the, the kinetic chain and cause problems with the knees and the hips and the low back. Hyperextending the knees. Kids tend to do this because it requires less muscle effort. You don't have to activate your quads or your glutes. How easy is that? But then, of course, they're stressing their knees. Genuvalgus, a bit more problematic because um, you can't correct that voluntarily. And we see a bunch of kids with excessive lordosis. And these extreme segmental alignment positions can contribute to pain. Sitting in sleeping positions, so kids flopping down in any position, W sitting or sitting cross-legged can lead to chronic pain. So I've had kids who had hips that were slipping out and it was because they were sitting W sitting or sitting cross-legged in school and we just modified that and then their hips were fine. So functional testing can be helpful um, to get beyond just the range of motion. Developmental scores can be helpful, but we want really want to know the quality. And a quick set of tests, and I'll show you, these are things you can quick do in your clinic to see whether these kids have motor control problems. So bilateral heel raise, bridging, single leg stand, and a wall sit. Um, so pediatric specialists kind of honed in on these as assessing a lot of the key problem areas. And let's see if this works on to your toes so they'll wobble around they won't be able to hold their position the ankles will go into excessive on to your toes they'll hyperextend their ankles hanging on the ankles for a bridge so of course we want them to be able to hold a nice straight position and they'll wobble around because they don't have the core strength they won't be able to hold it for a while or they'll lock their knees together for stability And you'd be surprised at how many younger kids present like this. Single leg stand, depending on their age. And then last one, the wall sit. Yeah. So she's locked her knees to together for stability because she didn't have the hip strength. And the pictures here on the right are after treatment, after teaching the motor control. So pain is another common complaint. We wanna look at why they might have pain. Obviously joint instability, if their patella is slipping out or their hip is slipping out, that's gonna be painful. Posture can contribute to pain. They may have excessive demands. They may be trying to do too much. Systemic inflammation in POTS and MCAS will both contribute. Visceral pain and menstrual pain can contribute to widespread pain complaints. Headaches and migraines are common. Trauma and distress from handling the medical system. I've had kids who have been told that there's nothing wrong with them and they should just get a grip on things and, and move on. And that can be pretty traumatizing. And then these conditions, all three hypermobility POTS and MCAS are associated with a sensitive nervous system. So central sensitization, but also autonomic nervous system and peripheral nerve sensitization. And so identifying which of these issues are contributing most to the pain 
in managing those. If you're not sure whether they have a sensitive nervous system, you can look at the different conditions associated with central sensitization syndrome. You can see EDS is here. So is POTS, hyperalgesia, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, irritable bowel, dyspepsia, headaches and migraines, chemical sensitivity, and neuropathy. So if you have kids with, who have multiple complaints, it's probably the nervous system driving it. Um, there's also a questionnaire called the Central Sensitization Inventory. This is the nine question one, super quick and easy, and you can classify them as subclinical, mild or moderate to severe sensitization. And it's a way that we can track it and see if our treatments are helping. Options for pain management. Of course, I always like fixing the problem. There are physical modalities such as ice and heat. Um, Cognitive behavioral therapy can work quite well, especially for a sensitive nervous system. TENS can help for kids. Manual therapy, bracing or taping, calming the nervous system, topicals, pain education, addressing widespread inflammation. Aerobic exercise is itself a pain management technique if they can do it without it causing pain. And then specific exercises to address specific problems. If they have a sensitive nervous system, there are a couple of free pain management apps designed for teenagers. I have a handout. Anything you see in purple text here, like exercise, neural calming, topicals, I have a handout for it on my website. You're welcome to access it and give it to patients. But the two pain management apps, WebMap, um, they go to different world environments, so a desert, a tropical rainforest, and they learn certain skills, whether it's relaxation skills or breathing skills or visualization skills. Um, and the app has kids practice each skill for a week because you have to practice to get good at it. So an excellent resource if they have a sensitive nervous system. Fatigue and sleep problems may be caused, obviously, by a sleep disorder. If you're not sleeping well, that in turn can be aggravated by pain in POTS. Physical discomfort at night will keep them awake. Poor nutrition will contribute to fatigue, medical distress, MCAS, POTS, stress and anxiety in general, and deconditioning will all contribute to fatigue. So a nice simple zero to 10 scale on fatigue. And again, these conditions are interlocked. So POTS can be aggravated by MCAS, by concussions and by cervical instability, which can be present in people who are hypermobile. Nutrition can be aggravated by food sensitivities associated with MCAS and other GI issues associated with hypermobility and POTS. So it gets complicated. So if you think they have POTS, you can do the POTS NASA stand or lean test in the clinic. All you need is a pulse oximeter and a blood pressure cuff and 15 minutes. Um, I have to say POTSDAM doesn't have a strong cardiology focus on diagnosing or managing POTS. So I do the test in the PT clinic. So you have them lay down for five minutes, monitor their heart rate, blood pressure, and symptoms. And then you have them stand up leaning against a wall without moving, fidgeting, or talking. These kids often fidget to keep their blood circulating. Then you monitor heart rate, blood pressure, and symptoms at minutes one, three, and five. And I'll stop at five minutes if it's a positive test. Um, you could continue for 10. And then they recommend you repeat supine measurements after testing. If it's a positive test, I don't bother. I'll just have them sit down. In adults, the criterion is an increase of heart rate of 30. In children, it's an increase of 40. Um, or a maximum heart rate of 130 in the old, younger kids or 125 in the older kids, because some kids have a high heart rate to begin with. If they have a heart rate, a resting heart rate of 85, you know, it may not go up 40 beats. And that's without a drop in systolic blood pressure um, or diastolic blood pressure, which of course would change the type of dysautonomia from, from POTS to orthostatic hypotension, um, but really both of those conditions are managed from a physical point of view the same way, the medications would be different. And patients who are hypermobile um, often will go between the two because the tachycardia is their compensation mechanism. If they don't compensate, their blood pressure drops and they pass out. If they do compensate, their heart beats really fast and, and gets that blood up to their brain. 
and we're monitoring for symptoms um, and for hands and feet turning purple. They may have a negative test if they're taking medications that affect their heart rate, so beta blockers, or if they're using effective self-care. So patients come to me, I do the test, they're positive. By the time they get to see a cardiologist in eight weeks, they've managed their POTS. They're drinking fluids, they're wearing compression leggings, they've been exercising, so they no longer have that reactive um, autonomic response and the test is positive. They're still vulnerable to POTS. They may get a flare of it, but the, the test is going to be negative if they're controlling it. And the recommendation is if you're going to send them for a tilt table test, withdraw all their treatment for 24 to 48 hours beforehand. So stop their medicines, tell them to not drink lots of water, tell them to not use their electrolytes, um, and they'll feel really lousy for a day and a half. Um, this graph, I'm not going to go through in detail, but it shows how different aspects of the POTS physiology lead to management. So increasing water and salt or electrolyte intake, wearing compression garments and exercise, iron supplementation, medication to cause vasoconstriction to get that blood back. Of course, avoiding triggers and reconditioning, avoiding sympathetic activation drugs, making sure they get sleep. Um, and for people who have tachycardias, their major symptom, the beta blockers. But again, remember that beta blockers can increase fatigue and migraines because you're just not going to get the blood up to the brain because you're interfering with the compensation mechanism of POTS. So some physical therapy interventions. Um, so stratified management, some of these patients are simple. You know, they sprained an ankle, they just need to see any PT for an ankle sprain. Um, they may have a tendonitis or um, a sore, sore shoulder. Then there are the intermediate patients. They may have recurrent episodes or multiple episodes. They're starting to become deconditioned because they can't exercise anymore. They're starting to have some sensitization and they may have some systemic issues. And these are gonna be a bit more complicated to treat. It can be helpful to have a PT knowledgeable about hypermobility. And then there are the really complex patients, the ones who are in wheelchairs or who can't get out of bed at all. Um, and they definitely would benefit from multidisciplinary management. Unfortunately, we don't have that kind of a resource around here. So my basic management approach, first helping to identify the systemic issues. So if they have POTS or MCAS or GI problems or sleep problems, some of those things I can help with, some of them I'll send them back to, to you for. Central sensitization um, and neural sensitization. If they have a, an irritated nervous system, everything is gonna make them worse. We need to calm that down before we can add intervention. And then educating them for good posture and joint protection so they're not mechanically stressing their body. Then we can add proprioceptive and motor control training and then stabilization strengthening and flexibility. When PT fails these kids, it's because it jumps straight into the stabilization without stabilizing them as people first and without making sure they have the necessary proprioception and motor control to do the exercises correctly. So joint protection and posture, helping them to choose appropriate postures and activities, giving them good support. So good shoes, chairs, desks, pencils, sometimes adaptive tools can be helpful and splints and braces. I'll give you a few examples. Teaching them not to hang on their, their ligaments, not lock their knees or hang on their hips and to avoid heavy forces like these heavy backpacks. So posture, um, setting them up so that they can have good posture. So give them a table to put that iPad on or a pillow so they're not hunching over it. Give them good chairs for the older kids, an ergonomic table that brings the, their work up to them. I'll have kids um, you know, put a book, tip a book against, um, or tip a notebook against a stack of books so that they can um, create a stand for their work so they're not hunching over. Um, this is called a NADA chair. It can give low back support if they need to sit without back support. For the kids who have to sit on the floor, a cushion can be helpful to take stress off the hips and the knees. And for the kids who have to fidget, um, these mobile sitting devices can be helpful as well. 
hands can be a problem. So hypermobile fingers will tend to lead to, to really forceful gripping so that they have a grip and so that they can feel where their fingers are. But of course, that will cause pain in the fingers and pain in the forearm muscles. So there's a whole bunch of assistive devices for kids for writing, um, for dynamic um, use. So if they're musical, there are dynamic splints that can allow the fingers to move, but give them stability so they don't move in the wrong direction. There's sometimes a debate about bracing and assistive devices. Some people will complain that it may make people weak, but if we can support jo joints in ways that allow for mobility, then kids will be more active and they will be stronger overall. If we immobilize a joint entirely, we do need to be careful about weakness. And so I ask my patients to, to make a commitment to staying strong. Um, so one patient, for example, who is a um, non-functioning ambulator, she can walk, but not far. And she wanted a wheelchair. And it's like, okay, but if you're going to be in the wheelchair, you have to do some leg strengthening exercises that day. And so we agreed that she would. So uh, some kids will need wheelchairs to be functional. They can walk a few feet, but they may have a hip that slips out if they walk more than five or 10 minutes. Here's a great example of a functional knee brace that's allowing her to be athletic. Um, smart crutches are really popular in these patients because they often have wrist and hand problems that don't allow them to use regular crutches or canes. Posture braces can be helpful as well. So proprioception, motor control, and stabilization training, um, emphasizing good quality movement before strengthening, making sure they are strengthening in the correct alignment and position. These aren't the kind of kids where you can just hand them a sheet and say, okay, go home and do these exercises because they probably will do them wrong and potentially hurt themselves more. They may have tight muscles, but you have to be super careful how you stretch them because they're going to stretch where they're already stretchy. So if they have tight quad muscles and they grab their quad and pull it back, they're going to stretch their lumbar spine into lordosis. That quad is way stronger than the lumbar spine. So we have to be super careful how we teach them to stretch. Start low and go slow so we don't flare these kids up. Um, I'm not going to read through this, but there's a bunch of research that shows that exercise is helpful for both hypermobility and POTS. There are a bunch of reasons why past exercise may have failed. So we may not have treated the whole person, the whole trifecta. We may not have addressed proprioceptive and motor control issues first to make sure they're able to do the exercises correctly. The exercises may have been too aggressive. In adults, we know that adults start rehab six to eight weeks weaker than a sedentary person. They can't just jump into the normal exercises that most PTs will give patients. These kids take longer to get stronger. Connective tissue responds much more slowly than muscle. Doing the exercises too often because the connective tissues are fragile and too much too often can damage the connective tissue. And of course, kids who don't like to do the exercises because they're boring. There are also surgical precautions, and I have a whole handout on surgical precautions. If you have kids who need to go in for surgery, orthopedic surgery is only half as effective in hypermobile adults as it is in non-hypermobile adults. Presumably, it's going to be similar for kids. So we definitely want to look for conservative management first. Um, these kids won't respond as well to surgeries as a non-hypermobile kid. The orthopedic surgeries are also more likely to have complications with one study reporting a 91% complication rate. Mast cell and POTS both contribute to those complications. Surgeons definitely should take hypermobility POTS and the MCAS into account. Um, again, complication rates. GI surgeries um, are likely to have more complications, but the big concern there is for kids with vascular EDS, which is fairly uncommon. School accommodations, so these kids often have problems with school. The website, the school toolkit um, has great suggestions. They are based in England, so we can't use them for legal um, accommodations, but great ideas. They have all of these content areas. 
Um, and they have handouts that kids can print out. So here's a handout that describes hypermobility. It says, here are the common symptoms of hypermobility and how it may affect me in school. And this can be a really good starting point for a discussion with the teacher or with the school if your kid needs accommodations. Multidisciplinary management is ideal um, if, if you can get it, um, but hard to do up here because we don't have enough of the specialists. So in summary, look for hypermobility when things don't make sense. So when you can't connect the issues, think connective tissues. Because remember, these patients often have a bunch of different things going on and it can be complicated and messy. And so when you have those messy patients where things just don't make sense, think about whether it might be a connective tissue disorder. Remember that hypermobility affects far more than just the joints. The joints are just what you see on the outside. So pain and function, gross and fine motor skill, but also cognitive, sensory, emotional, and social function, fatigue, GI, urinary function, and bleeding, especially for those adolescent females. PT can be really helpful for managing these issues. Um, people and kids with hypermobility don't always tolerate standard PT. PT should never make things worse. So I'm not asking you to send them, send them all to me. Send them to whatever PT they have a relationship with already. But if, if it's not working, and if you have those patients who are more complicated, more that intermediate or complex, um, then an EDS specialist PT can be helpful. Each child is an individual. There's no standard treatment for everyone. Um, and these are chronic conditions and the patients may benefit from extended or recurrent care. So I'll see my patients sometimes once a week for maybe four to six weeks and then maybe every other week for a couple more weeks and then maybe a month or two later to follow up. Um, and these, aren't, these patients aren't gonna go to PT for four to six weeks and be cured. And really listen to the patients and the parents believe what they say. Um, the medical traumatization is real. Um, I think you guys do a great job. Um, I don't hear about medical traumatization from the local patients as much as I hear it from um, patients who live elsewhere. Um, but we really want to make sure we're identifying these kids. I have a whole bunch of handouts and resources for you. So the PDF um, that you have access to, all of these links will work. I have a website that has a bunch of handouts on it, um, some that are specifically for children. I have a lecture series that I do for patients and the recordings and slides are on my website and many of them are relevant to kids. These are resources from other organizations for hypermobility. Some resources for POTS, a couple of articles if you want more nuts and bolts about management and the Dysautonomia International is great patient information and the NASA lean test, the instructions are here and a form you can fill out while you're doing the test. Resources for GI problems. So these are some great articles that talk about the GI issues with each of these conditions. Resources for mast cell activation and some good websites available, including the medications. So we don't have any allergists up here who manage mast cell activation. So the primary care providers are the ones who really need to do this, at least the first steps that involve the over-the-counter medications. And there's a good guide here um, for how to start with H1 and H2 inhibitors. And I've got loads and loads and loads of references. And thank you very much. And now I'm open for questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. I'm not, oh, yep, are you there? Can you hear me? I can. Oh, um, so I've had uh, quite a few patients, uh, two of which are transgendered, who've had um, a lot of the POTS symptoms and um, 
have passed out in school, have had difficulties in school, um, other than helping increase blood volume with salt and diet, are there other things you recommend for those yep. specific patients? Yep. And you, you bring up a, a important thing. I should add a slide there. The transgender issues. So gender dysphoria is very common in this population. Most often of children who are born female um, transitioning to male. Um, but it is more common in this population in, than in the general population. But for kids who are passing out in school, so yes, electrolytes, they can't drink pure water. It has to have electrolytes in it to be absorbed properly. Compression leggings. And I mean, I could do a whole lecture on POTS. Um, that would be a different topic. But compression leggings, waist high, preferably. So we used to recommend knee high socks, and that does not work well. So waist high leggings. Um, sometimes the sports clothing can work well. So there's sports clothing that has compression um, for the girls. Um, slimwear has some compression to it. In the summertime, when people don't like to wear full leg leggings, um, tight like bikes, bicycle shorts that address the abdominal area can be helpful. And then encouraging the kids to fidget, so moving their feet around so that they're pumping the, the blood around, not having them sit still for too long, avoiding high carbohydrate, high sugar meals um, would all be strategies. There are some what we call countermeasures where if they feel really woozy, they feel like they're going to pass out, they can cross their legs, bend over at the waist, um, press on their belly. So there are a few counter maneuvers that they can do if they're feel if the world's starting to go black. I have a checklist for POTS self-care on my website. So if you want to download that and share that with kids, it gives a whole list of things that they should avoid um, and things that they can do. So hot showers, for example, can trigger POTS flare. People will pass out in the shower. Um, turning the water cooler can solve that problem. Great question. Other questions? Okay. Well, um, the slides have my contact information. Feel free to contact me if you have questions about patients. There's loads of resources on my website. As I mentioned, I've got handouts on hypermobility, on POTS, on mast cell, on exercise, on pain management, and a fair number of those handouts are pediatric specific. Um, I've got a video series, as I said, that I do live, but also the recordings are there. That can be helpful if you have kids who are having migraines and headaches. It can be helpful for them to look at that and see if any of that helps them to, to do more effective self-care. Okay, well, I think we're right on schedule again. Thank you very much for taking time to, to think about this group of patients and thank you for, for working with them. Thank, thank you. you.